Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Amplified and Intensified with your host, Eric Taylor, myself, Shiva Maharaj. Today is going to be a super quick one because Eric over here has some Chick-fil-A on the way and I cannot keep him back. That stuff <laughs> is better when it is warm. With that, Eric, what's the first one on here? What's going on, bud? So we definitely want to talk about a hacker released right around 180 thousand credentials for SSL VPN to the dark web a couple of days ago through one of the growth sites. And it's really, really interesting to see this, you know, at first we were going through, we, as a, you know, me internally and, you know, a bunch of cybersecurity folks, and we started digging into this, the traversal flaw for the Fortinet OS or the 40 OS was from back in 2018. So we're like, at first it, it eluded us. Was, I didn't notice that it was part of that CVE where we were seeing this data dump and it only after about a, an hour or so, I actually saw this and the fact that I can say with a hundred percent certainty, there are usernames and passwords on this data list that I picked randomly that are still working right now. So I don't know when these things were actually scanned, but there's definitely a whole bunch of people who do not have updated firewalls by any means, because this is pretty, pretty old. So we're talking here about a three year old vulnerability mm -hmm. that has, has it been mitigated by Fortinet at least yes. within the last three years. Oh, many times over. So we are talking about IT practitioners, internal IT, and other providers who just did not update their firewalls. But here's the scary thing about SSL VPN, which is why I've been moving away from it. And you and I have been having conversations ad nauseum about this. Mm -hmm. How many people are still using SSL VPNs, but they're not using any type of MFA? And real MFA, not that text-based bullshit. Not a whole lot of people. Um, so, I mean, we're a Fortinet partner, so we primarily use, I think I've said it before, but, uh, we use a primarily Fortinet or, um, Apollo Alto, just depending on, you know, the deal or the application base that was going to be put out there. But uh, what, what Eric is saying, small Fortinet, big Palo Alto. Palo Alto. They even have a city bot name behind them. Anyway, <laughs> um, there's not many Fortinets or there's not many firewalls out there that will actually invoke a 2FA token, like, you know, a TOTP code, I should say, for 2FA. Like, I'm looking more for something like a dual push. I hate those TOTP based things. Mm -hmm. And Fortinet has that. You have to use a dual gateway, same thing with Palo Alto. Um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, back in the days when I used Sophos, you probably remember more than I do. I'm a Meraki whore, so Cisco, Cisco, shit's all built in. Yeah. Does it work flawlessly? No. Well, yes, it works flawlessly, but it takes a lot of effort to configure appropriately. So I guess my question to you was, how do people get in touch with you? So you can scan their Fortinet, update it, and unfuck the situation they're in because their current IT provider fucked it up. <laughs> I mean, really easy. Just barricade cyber.com. My calendar link is literally right there on the homepage, right? Right there in that whole banner area. Make it really easy. And what are they looking at time? Let's say they book you whatever time. How long would it take you or a practitioner at your caliber to mitigate this? Typically within the same day. Okay. And are we talking about cycling passwords? Because I'm assuming SSL VPN passwords are probably connected to LDAP yep. for their active directory. And these are actual user passwords that can get into email and all kinds of other platforms, especially if there's no MFA involved. Yep. So for the tech savvy folks that will be either watching or listening to this, definitely go follow, go to my LinkedIn page. There's an onion site. So, you know, I'm not going to publicly, you know, pump out the actual file just for legal reasons. But if you want to go to the onion site on your own accord, 
then download it and unpack it and all this stuff. But what we've been recommending for the more tech savvy folks is to do a user dump out of your active directory and leverage PowerShell to parse this text file and see if these user number, usernames match up, you know, and the file is a freaking garbage mess. It's, it was well, not exported friendly. I read that there were either 500,000 lines or 500,000 user. Yes. Pairs. I don't, I don't have the exact number cause we're still trying to clean up the whole mess ourselves. Okay. Uh, and you know, just for legal reasons, I won't show the text file, but you know, if you ever open up notepad or yeah, notepad plus plus, and you see those, no, 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 those black nulls all over the place. This thing is peppered with it. It's crazy. But is this a vulnerability that could have been mitigated aside from being smart and updating your stuff, but with having MFA in place? MFA would have definitely helped because they would have never been able to confirm a connection. Okay. Yeah. You know, and um, this really goes into the recent zero day that I know we have on deck here. Getting access to a network or a device with all of the privilege escalation vectors out there. Now is even more time where you have to protect the identity and the network. For, I know for the last year, everyone's been saying, protect the identity, protect the identity. Well, now you can escalate a re standard user to an admin user, even if you're just doing Azure AD. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what's, yeah. which, uh, which RCE is this one that we're looking at here? This is around the Microsoft Word embedded, uh, ActiveX controls. So this, for those who are watching on the YouTube feed, this is a really, really ugly video, but in essence, if you actually go out there and look, there is a word document that's actually being called, that's making an HTTP header call to a remote server that then enables my, uh, Microsoft calculator to be executed. So by embedding HTML code, once again, wrapped around ActiveX, it can be done to do whatever. So in a real world scenario, if I was hosting malicious content on a web server, I could change that to actually go to that web server and download a ransomware payload, um, a Mimi cats exploits, whatever, um, and be able to start infecting your network. You know, there's still the whole, this whole thing could be dominoed really. And this is really what people need to understand. The amount of CVEs are still out there. They're still hit and miss with print high, uh, print matrix, print hive exploit. Well, print nightmare and hive nightmare. I think it is. Yep. yep. Those exploits are still out there in the wild. So. Well, I mean, we're seeing Fortinet 2018 CVEs being leveraged today. So it's not like everything's going to be patched within two months of announcement. Exactly. But this really needs to get a little bit more attention. People need to pay attention because it's not just, oh, we just got one exploit to worry about. You know, I mean, we're CrowdStrike partners and they released something earlier today where they are putting up mitigation steps and monitoring for the, the CVE. But it's more monitoring, if I'm not mistaken, because even Microsoft doesn't have a mitigation for the full threat. Correct. Unless I'm mistaken here. So they have what's called a workaround. So essentially, and sorry if I just gave someone Tourette's um, by scrolling that thing too fast for those on YouTube, but they want you to and basically set up your three zone or your four zones to disable ActiveX controls. Now, the one thing, you know, a colleague of ours, Robert down there in Florida was like, well, we got customers who actually need ActiveX, but it will tell you right here, new ActiveX controls will not be installed. Previously installed ActiveX controls will continue to run. So as long as your systems have not been compromised with the new ActiveX control, that's leveraging the, uh, leveraging that exploit, then you should be okay. Is that CrowdStrike picking up on the new? Installs of ActiveX being compromised as of right Suppos now? As of right now, supposedly, yes. Definitely okay. got some more calls um, coming up with, you know, Cameron, who's been on our show several times. He'll be on uh, this Monday. Yep, he will. And 
we will uh we'll have some more conversations so it may be something that we have them back again next week to talk about these type of things and you know it's not to you know say you must use crowdstrike but i but want you should. To, yeah, yeah we believe we, you should through eric or myself don't go to any other partner we only endorse ourselves but the thing that people need to understand is like okay we're good we're using crowdstrike as an example and the reason why we went to CrowdStrike is because of this example. When you start seeing these CVEs coming out, you need to be having conversations with whoever your security the, uh, whatever your security platform is, whatever your EDR platform is, and say, hey, this CVE is out. What are you doing to help me to detect and or mitigate these threats? And Shiva, you've been on those email chains. So I, I'm quick to email oh, everybody. Course. At CrowdStrike, and they are awesome. Yeah, I never got that with Bitdefender by any means. And you know, I know that they're you know overseas; they're not based in the U.S. But that's their so. problem. That's not ours. <laughs> I mean, uh, listen, if you want to do business here, have local talent, have local techs here that can do something. Don't make me wait for Romanian time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Uh, but that aside, I, you know, this really goes back to having defense in depth and layering security with all the CVEs and all the approaches that can get in, unless I'm mistaken here. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the top three things people should do right now, aside from doing that basic baseline mitigation, what should they do to harden their systems to attempt to prevent unauthorized access? Least privilege. You know, we okay. talked about that a couple of times, you know, making sure that people just don't have blind ad administrative rights to do whatever they need to do by either, you know, leveraging GPOs or auto elevate or any of the other tools that are out there that can help mitigate that. Make sure you have proper MFA. And, and what is proper MFA? We're talking text messages here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and for those listening, I am joking. <laughs> exactly. You know, we, we strongly recommend Duo, but you know, you do have Authy. Well, I only recommend Duo. That's because of the push notification, right? So lazy. Give me the push. Let me decide if I want to ignore it or not, not just blindly accept it. Well, see, push has a level of complexity that I like. You know, not only. It's something it's you some, have and something you have to do. Exactly. You're not generating a code. So if something of mine got popped. Somebody guessed my username and password to something. I'm getting a notification versus a TOTP code that has to be entered. And we know I have done it before with several partners where I can brute force that TOTP code for days before getting in. But you, that goes back. A lot of vendors talk the security game, but they're so far from it. Mm -hmm. You know, you ha I'm sure you've enumerated certain things that would make me cry knowing that my vendors have those in place. Yeah. But all right. Last thing on the docket here today before I let you go for that uh, Chick fil A, because as soon as we're off here, I'm driving to go get some myself. <laughs> I got you going. Oh, hell yeah. Lockbit 2.0. A couple of weeks ago, our very first uh, Friday series, we mentioned Lockbit and their TTPs and the fact that they're looking for insider threats. And a lot of the news agencies or cybersecurity news, news agencies, have said that Lockbit 2.0 is finding great success with their new affiliate program. And I do want to highlight or highlight again that their affiliate program is going directly to insiders to mm -hmm. gain access. And if this is true, how are you protecting your company against insider threats? And you know, my typical question, Eric, what would you recommend? Top three things for them to defend against insider threats. You know, this, you love put me on the spot. Top three things. What's your top no, three no, things? Not. <laughs> so, I mean, we just talking about Lockbit. I mean, this really goes back to, you know, what I just said, you know, Lockbit is known for using insider threats. So making sure people don't have the access that they're supposed to, you know, path least permissions invoked on a user, you know, even the domain admins. They need to have their own separate user when they're going in as a domain admin. And we're not sharing separate. credentials anymore. No, you're not supposed to. This should be two users. Dude, um, 
You think the average IT person or company is going to spend the extra money for that license? Mm, whatever. It's only security at stake here. Mm. I mean, if we can, if we can use three-year-old software on firewalls, what's a shared credential? Oh, I see it. Let's <laughs> like, I see it. You see it. <laughs> All right, everybody. So if this doesn't get edited out, that's my little guy, Hunter. So anyway, <laughs> he's the boss of this podcast. So yeah. right now, always, but, but anyway, but the other thing, the third thing I would recommend is logging because most of these ransomware attacks have a lot of signatures. They have IOCs that are key indications of a ransomware, you know, there's you really need to make sure you're doing your logging and ingesting that and actually looking for those IOCs that, you know, ma massive amounts of data being changed at one time is an indicator of compromise. You know, either somebody's deleting a metric fuck ton of files or you're getting encrypted. The only thing I would add there to, I mean, you're basically giving the same answer as before, because let's be honest, once you do the basics really well, you're in a better position. And exactly. the only thing I would add to that as a must is stay on top of your updates and your patching for your software. And please do not miss out on firmware upgrades. I know providers tell their clients, we don't upgrade your drivers because we don't want things to break. Well, that's how people get in. Mm. Don't be a sucker. Don't believe that. It's better to break functionality than to break security. A lot of the breaking of functionality can be mitigated. You know, there are, Depends on the functionality that you're talking about, but yeah, I mean, you're updating your firewall doesn't break a whole lot of functionality on your internal network. Shouldn't break any. Right. I mean, worst case, it breaks your VPN. You can't use that. I'm not crying for reducing a surface that, uh, threat, threat surface area. Now, I think the only thing I've ever seen, even back in the Sophos days, when a firmware was being updated on your firewall was the DNS filtering would get all jacked up on one of the versions. And maybe I haven't seen that in some time, but we're yeah. limited with how much cell phones we use these days. So exactly. So I'm just saying there's no reason to have. Don't buy the bullshit. Patches. Yeah. Just patch it. It's like, yeah, sorry. If you, if you can't proactively do it, call Shiv or myself. We'll be happy to call, talk to you about actually doing it for you. I charge. When I say I, I help, I charge. <laughs> Capitalist. There we go. With that, I'm done. Unless you have anything else you want to add. Nope. chick fil getting cold. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for tuning in for yet another episode of Amplified and Intensified. If you're watching this on YouTube, please give us a rating. Share us with somebody. If you're watching the uh, listening to the audio version of this, please go to Apple Podcast and give us a rating. Let us know how we're doing. And if we're stuck, let us know too. Again, always check us out. Amplified and intensified. If you have any questions, comments, concerns that you want to bring up, please email info at amplifiedandintensified.com. And until next time, take care.